Everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our development uh, session tonight. We're asking, Lord, that your word will make us grow up in Jesus' name. Amen. Produce teachers and leaders, evangelists and pastors, that will win souls and their multitudes unto you through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Teach us, Lord, your word. Let your word find a place in every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. But covet honestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. As Paul the Apostle wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote to them about Christ because he said, I will not know anything, anyone among you except Christ crucified who is our Savior. And from the very first chapter, he began to lift up Jesus Christ, the one who has come to save us. And the one who has come to prepare us for glory. He corrected some things in the Corinthian church. He encouraged them and he showed them the gifts of the Spirit in this chapter in particular. But now as it comes to the conclusion of the chapter, he says, Covet honestly the best gifts. Don't stay where you have been. And don't remain stagnant spiritually. And now he says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to reveal to you. I'm going to lay it plain before you. The more excellent way. That is the more excellent way of life. The more excellent way of ministry. The more excellent way of glorifying the Lord. And immediately he said that, he moves on to chapter 13. Which is telling us what it means by the most, by the more excellent way. It says in verse, chapter 13, verse 1 Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I may come as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and do I have all faith so that I could remove mountains? And have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to the burnt, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Obviously, as we make the connection between the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the way of charity and the way of love. And he says in ministry, in whatever we do, and in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, and in doing the work of the Lord in the church of the living God, he says charity is the essential thing. Charity is the number one thing. Charity is the indispensable thing. Charity is the very foundation of all we do in the kingdom. It says, if I do this, if I have this, if I give this, if I sacrifice that, and I do not have this charity. It says in verse 1, I just be like a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. It might appear to be shining and resounding loud, but it says it has no life, and it will not minister life to the people who are hearing. In verse 2, it says, if I have this, this, and that, great, great gifts, and I do not have this charity, I have not discovered the way, excellent, to minister. It says, I am nothing. I might be somebody in the sight of the people. I might even be somebody in my own sight. But he says, in the sight of God, and before the evolution of heaven, he says, I am nothing. And then he says, even though I give all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my 
body to be burnt. I'm so zealous for what I stand for. And I zealously and earnestly defend what I'm standing for. That I can even give my body to be burnt. It says, even then it profits me nothing. That means then, this excellent way that he describes to us, this excellent way that he reveals to us is so very important. Look at verse 4. Now he's going to be telling us what that charity entails. Verse 4. Charity suffers long. Ministry demands suffering. Suffering from the world. Suffering from false brethren. Suffering from circumstances beyond your control. And it says all the same. If you have discovered the more excellent way, you keep on ministering. You know, suffering long. And it's kind. That is, the suffering does not change his personality. The suffering does not change his character. Put it this way. Your circumstances or your suffering will not redefine your character. If this is your character, if this is your personality, if this is the way you ought to go, a lot of things will happen in the way. And your environment will not discolor you. Your environment will not redefine you. That same character, that conversion, that sanctification, that Holy Ghost power has created and formed your life will still be what you have. You suffer long and you are kind. Envious not. There are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelists, there are pastors, there are teachers. Whichever one you have, you are not envying the other people. It says, it wants not itself, it's not popped up, there's no pride. And does not behave itself unseemly. Does not behave himself in a way that will say, Why is he acting like that? Why is he behaving like that? Oh, and somebody says, You know what he's going through? Because of what he's going through, he's a nice man ordinarily. He's a nice woman ordinarily. But because of what he's going through, he says, No, what you are going through will not change you. You're a minister. Are you a minister? In the way, excellent. It says, whatever winds may blow, it will not redefine your character. You are following Christ, and you keep on following Christ, and you do not behave yourself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. That is, it doesn't come to the other side of, what can I get out of this? What can I benefit out of this? It's not seeking his own good. It's seeking the good of the people. It's not easily provoked. Easily provoked. That means that he knows the Lord has called him. It's like, if you can imagine, here is Christ on the one hand. If you could see him, and he says, I've given you a call. I've given you a ministry. I've given you an assignment. And he's standing right there. And there is a kind of poor, wretched, puny fellow on this other side. And he's trying to distract your attention. And Christ is standing there saying, remember, I gave you a call. I gave you a ministry. That means then, as we're looking at Christ who has chosen you, the puny fellow is there, will not be so strong as to shift your attention from Christ so that it's not provoking you to now dishonor Christ or to disobey Christ. Thinketh no evil. He rejoiceth not in equity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. The grace of God is sufficient. And the grace of God is so great. The grace of God is so deep. The grace of God is so high that whatever comes in ministry, 
And whatever challenges confront you in ministry, when you are walking in the more excellent way, you're not going to deviate, you're not going to say, I can't go on anymore. I can't do that anymore. At the beginning, I thought I could run the race to the end. But you know, with the challenges I face now, what can I do? In my circumstances, no, you endure all things and you are going to endure to the end. I said you are going to endure to the end. The greater the challenge, the greater the grace. The greater the challenge, the greater the power, the greater the challenge, the greater the enablement that the Lord will give. Now he tells us in verse 13, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these, everybody, is charity. Serving God is a great privilege. Serving Christ with an attitude of gratitude is both acceptable and rewardable. You're serving Christ, there's something inside you. He saved me. He redeemed me. He died for me. He paid such a great price for me. And because of that, every day of my life, I want to show gratitude in my attitude. And it's the gratitude that leads me to serve in Him. Service is what we render in gratitude for salvation. Saved from the wrath to come, we want others too to be saved. Salvation by grace through faith is the prerequisite of service. We cannot tell other people to repent if we have not repented. We cannot wake other people up and give them spiritual life, resurrection, if we are still dead ourselves. And so salvation is a prerequisite to service, sanctification with consecration and absolute surrender is the foundation of a faithful service. If you are going to be faithful through and through, with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, if you're going to be faithful all the way through, if you're going to be faithful in little things and in big things, sanctification is a necessary experience and the baptism in the Holy Spirit is necessary and indispensable for power in service if we're going to fulfill a service to the Christian body and to the world. God's word shows us, reveals to us the more excellent way of acceptable and eternally rewardable service. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the more excellent way of rewardable service. If a service, if a ministry, if a giving, if whatever we do, it's going to be acceptable and rewardable in eternity. It has to follow this more excellent way. Three things to look at. Number one, the more excellent way. The more excellent way. In front of that, love. L-O-V-E. I'm going to use the letters of that word, love. The more excellent way which is love. We'll come back to First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. But covet honestly the best gifts, and yet, after you got those best of gifts, show I, reveal I unto you a more excellent way. And it tells us in chapter 16 of this same Corinthians chapter 16, reading from verse 14, verse 13, and verse 14. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. It's saying that as you come into the ministry, it says, watch ye. It's talking to people that have the mind of a soldier. The backbone of a soldier. The concept of a soldier. 
He's talking to people that understand that the ministry is not for weak-minded people. It's not for spineless people. It's not for people that don't have any backbone. It's not for amphibians. They never, they cannot be on land. They cannot be in sea. They cannot swim against the tide. And they, not, they cannot climb up the mountain. It says, no, if you're going to be a minister, and if you're going to walk the excellent way, watch, stand. And then he goes on to say, quit you like men. That he is, carry yourself like a man. A man that is not just natural, a man that has salvation, a man that has Christ on the inside, a man that has the power of the Holy Ghost supporting him and sustaining him, quit you like men. Be strong. That means your mind, you are strong, in your conviction, you are strong, and in your disposition, you are strong, in your courage, you are strong. The way you carry yourself, that is when you are ministry, your body might be getting weak because you are maybe, or your physical condition. But all the same, when it comes to ministry, it says you will act like a strong man, strong conviction and strong courage and strong in your mind and then it says in verse 14 let all your things be done with charity everything you do it says it must come out this way that heaven can record it and heaven can register it that you're doing everything with charity the more excellent way is the more if the way of charity is the way of love Charity is essential in all forms of service. However low the service might appear to be, however high the service might appear to be, however temporary the service might appear to be, however long the service might appear to be, charity is very important. It is what gives your service a quality that will make that service acceptable in the sight of God. The form of service, it may be preaching or praying. Let it be done of charity. Your form of service may be counseling or caring. Let it be done of charity. Your form of service may be feeding or financing. You are feeding the poor. You are financing the poor. You are giving. Let it be done of charity. Your service may be evangelizing or empowering. You are evangelizing the world. You are empowering the church. Let it be done with charity. Your service may be edu educating or edifying. You are educating people in the knowledge of the truth, in the knowledge of God. We we'll call it theology. That is the knowledge of who God is and what God requires. Or maybe in church life, ecclesiology, whatever it is, edifying or educating, you do it with charity. Your, your ministry might be healing or helping. You're healing the sick or you're helping people. Whatever the ministry is, must be done with charity. It may be discipling or developing discipling converts or developing believers it says everything you do look at that verse 14 again let all your things be done with charity charity in service is love in service what does that amount to let's look at this l labor to save others you cannot do that with hatred you cannot do that with animosity. You cannot do that with conflict in your mind. It has to be done in love. Labor to save others. O, occupy in seeking others. Seeking others. You're seeking them to bring them out of the wilderness of sin into the kingdom of the Lord our Savior. Occupy in seeking others v volunteer to serve others don't let it be something imposed on you that we're dragging you we're pushing you or we're threatening you before you say okay okay if i cannot escape it i'm here i'm here what can i do now no you'll volunteer to serve others e endeavor to sacrifice for others 
We have to think of all that in any kind of service we render. Rendering service to the people in the world that Jesus died for. And rendering uh, service to the people in the kingdom who, are already, who have already tasted the beginning of the grace of God in salvation. Look at this one by one. Labor to save others. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 8. Here it says, Now, he that planteth, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. According to his own labor. I labor, you labor, but everything goes on record. And we might be doing the same thing, but the attitude in which we are doing it might be different. The disposition we have might be different. The mind we have might be different. Somebody might be doing this, exactly the same thing, and it comes out in the open as if they are equally talented, and they are equally dutiful, and they are equally righteous. It appears they are doing the same way. But even though the effect might look the same, the heart might be different. One is doing it with gratitude. I don't think I can have any other opportunity greater than this. And it's an opportunity given to me by the Lord. He could have called another person to do it, but look at me. He called me of all people to do this. Thank you, Jesus. And then you do it with all your heart. The other fellow is doing it, but he's saying, this is all they give me to do. They don't understand what I could really do. And this is all now what I'm doing. Huh? Another person can easily do this. Okay, if this is what's available, I hope they are going to change this and they're going to give me something greater later. There's no gratitude. Even though they, both of them are doing it the same way. And each person will receive his own reward according to his own labor. It says in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man, let every man, let every man uh, take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Labor to save others. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. We're reading from verse nine. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. Wherefore we labor, we labor, and it is an important labor. It says we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done whether good or bad Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men, knowing that judgment will come at the end of life. We're persuading them, we're pleading with them, we're saying, Come to the Lord. We persuade men. Look at verse 18 of that same chapter. It says, And all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To which that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's our labor. We're bringing sinners to the Savior. We labor to save others. Oh, occupy in seeking others. Occupy in seeking others. Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 10. Here the Lord Jesus tells us the very essence of his own ministry. 
and the essence of the ministry he has passed on to us. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now he's passed that to us, verse 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, what did he say? Occupy till I come. Don't retire. Occupy till I come. Keep on seeking. Those who are lost, occupy till I come. Don't say, they frightened me out of the ministry. I consecrated. I wanted to do everything. But pastor, you need to know the condition of my region, of my state, of my local government, of my group, and of my local church. That place is terrible. They frightened me out of activity. Says no. Not the one who has called you. And not the one who has given you the assignment. It says, occupy till I come. You're seeking the lost. But you're also seeking for Christians. Those who are born again. And they need to be uh, developed. They need to be followed up. You're seeking them too. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 verse 25 then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul that's the soul of Tarsus to seek Saul that's what that became Paul the apostle to seek Saul bring them to fellowship verse 26 and when he had found him he brought him unto Antioch and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves for the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Occupy in seeking others. V. Volunteer to serve others. Whatever service they require, we just studied. Recently in our Bible study, John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17, watching the same speech, that even though it's a lowly service, volunteer. Or it may be a kind of service that you are well talented in, volunteer. It might be something you are not even familiar with. And they say, can you do this? And you have learned to say, Yes, I can, by the grace of God. Even though you don't have experience, if I need to read, I'll go and read. I need to pray, of course, I'll go and pray. I need to go and ask other people that have done it before me. I'll go and ask them. I'll never say, no, I cannot do that. No, I'm not caught for that. No, I'm not trained for that. Can you do this? Yes, I can, by the grace of God. I can do. I can do. I said I can do. All things through. Christ, which strengtheneth me, he'll strengthen you. That's why you don't reject. You never reject any offer. And anything that you know you're supposed to do. Can you do this? I'm asking you now. You can? How can you? Because I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, volunteer and get it done. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, that's the charity there, by love serve one another. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2 from verse 20. Philippians chapter 2 verse 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Paul the Apostle was talking about the many people that served along with him. And he said, 
Although Timothy is not, you know, the strong uh, personality, is not the champion on the athletic field, is not somebody that, you know, is so energetic, he can run, he really race with the winning team in the Olympics. No, it's not like that. But in his physical weakness, and in his timid uh, kind of disposition, he's dependable, he's available, and he's faithful, and he will do whatever has to be done with the right attitude. He says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your stage, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But she know the proof of him, that as a son or the father, he has served with me in the gospel. That's the way it should be, volunteer to serve others. And he endeavor to sacrifice for others. Endeavor to sacrifice for others. What sacrifice? Sacrifices after you've done everything that is your duty to do, you volunteer, you are ready, you are available to go the extra mile. When everybody is saying, that's enough now. We've done enough. We've tried enough. I we've done what I didn't even know I could do. I could go as far. Can you imagine? Look at what I've done. And look at the things I've cleared. And look at my faithfulness. And look at the people that were one to the Lord. And there is still something left to be done. That extra mile is a sacrifice. The one you do without sweating, that's good, but that's no sacrifice. The one you do and you don't feel the pain, that's good, but there's no sacrifice there. But the one that pinches you, and the one that pains you, and the one that says that you're going the extra mile, that's what we're talking about. And thank God, the Lord will give you the grace. Amen. Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 7, sacrifice going the extra mile. Romans chapter 14, here reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, For none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. That is, your body alive, it belongs to God. Amen. Amen. And then when you are finished and you are dead, that body belongs to your village. I said, does it belong to your village? And your people say, uh -uh, you can't depart, you cannot bury him. We're taking him to the village. I pray you will give them information before you go that your life, your death, whoever you are here or there belongs to the Lord. And thank God I belong to the Lord. In Second Corinthians chapter Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. That's the attitude of the one that is following the more excellent way. He does everything he does with love. He labors to save others. He occupies in seeking others. He volunteers to serve others. He endeavors to sacrifice for others. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 33, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading here in verse 33. It says in verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit. Not seeking my own profit. You know some people, 
you have to pitch them, you have to appeal to them, you have to give them some carrot, and you have to kind of pamper them, you have to appreciate them, you have to lift them up, and you have to smile a lot before they say, okay, they love me, they accept me, so I will try now and work. And once you stop giving the carrot, the carrot, then they cannot walk again. But Paul the Apostle said, Oh, I've given my life to serve the Lord. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Give me the stick or give me the carrot, I'm walking. Give me a smile or give me a frown and I'm walking. Because I'm not walking for the people frowning. I'm not walking for the people smiling. I'm walking for the almighty God. And I'm walking so that they can be saved. So he said, even as I please all men in all things, seeking, not seeking my own will, but the profit of many that tell me here, that they may be saved. That that's your intention, that's your goal, and that's what you have in mind, that they may be saved. Point number two. Point number two, the most expensive waste. The most expensive waste. The waste of our lives. The waste of our talent. The waste of our ministry. The waste of our opportunity and the waste of the gift we have, the most expensive waste that causes eternal loss. Welcome to First Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1. In First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? Hold on, before you can do that, you put in a lot of hours. If it's spiritual gift of uh, tongues of men and angels, you have to be saved, get sanctified, fear with the Holy Ghost, and pray for the gifts of the Spirit that now you are flowing in the languages of men and angels. That's expensive. That's expensive. And it says, and yet if I have that and have not charity and become as uh, and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Or if it's on the secular side, on the personal development side, you've heard Apollos and he spoke that man was eloquent and say, I want to be eloquent like that. And then you go through drilling and training. You go through the language structure and you go through the presentation and you go through the coaching. That takes time. And when you've done all that, you're able now to speak in an eloquent manner. And it says, if there's no charity, all the hours you put into learning that language, all the hours you put into speaking eloquently like Apollos, is a waste, a colossal waste, an expensive waste. A waste of your time, a waste of your training, a waste of your life, a waste of your service. Look at verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, that takes time for you to have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. That takes time, that's expensive, and all knowledge, that's expensive. And though I have all fears so that I could remove mountains, that's expensive. And now, if you've acquired all that, you pray for the sick, just like that they get healed. Blind eyes are open. That takes time. And then you go and the lame is rising and is walking. And the mountain there, and they know you are a specialist. They always come to you. Hey, we have a mountain here. Can you help us? Well, of course I can. And then you go there and say, mountain, get out of that place. And you have the faith and it's gone. Before you get to that level, that's expensive. You put a lot of your life into having that gift of the spirit. And then it says, and have not Charity, I am nothing. An expensive waste. You've wasted your very life. You've wasted your very gift. You've wasted everything. It says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, 
And then, I, though I give my body to be bought and have not charity, it profited me nothing. It's not okay about somebody just having position and it's not having productivity. It's taking all he has and it's giving food. It's generous. It's feeding the hungry. It's financing those who are needy. And you can count on him. And, and that takes time. Everything you have acquired, everything you have reproduced, you're distributing. And it says yet. If you don't have this love that the Bible is talking about, the divine love of Christ in their heart, it says you're wasting your life and you're wasting your gifts and you're wasting your opportunities because when you come to the other side, there's nothing to show for your sacrifice. And uh, you know, people are thinking you're going to be number one on the queue when we get to heaven, if we get there. And then uh, they're looking for you when we're lining up, when the saints go marching in, and the person that should be at the, you know, topmost uh, place in the queue was saying, where is he? Where is she? And it's not there. And then we all realize she wasted all her resources. He wasted all his resources. That's why this point number two is the most expensive waste which is eternal loss. I'm sure you know these stories, but let me just uh, read a few to you. By the grace of God, we are uh, Bible believers, and we know these uh, people we're reading about. I'm reading Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse, reading from verse 10. Exodus chapter 4. We're reading from verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither the for nor since thou hast uh, spoken unto thy servant. And then he goes on to say, But I am slow speech and of a slow tongue. He said, I'm not eloquent. I asked God said, You are the one I've chosen. You are the one to do it. It's not the eloquence. Now look at verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and said, It's not Aaron the Levite, thy brother. Don't I know him? I know that he can speak well. I know he has the communication ability. I know he's eloquent. I know he has the gift of communication that she did not have. Also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. I even know where he is now. And I know what, that he's coming. And he will be glad in his heart. But look up, brothers and sisters. God still gave that assignment to, who did God give the assignment to? Moses, the one who said it was not eloquent. But he said, okay, the eloquent man, let him assist you, let him help you. And Moses went to the top of the mountain for just 40 days, not up to two months. In the absence of Moses, the... Um, Children of Israel came to our man, eloquent man, and said, what are we waiting for? As for this Moses, we don't know what has happened to him. Make us gods that will follow. And he said, bring all your earrings and everything. A calf came out, and God said, Moses, go down to your people. They've gone out of the way. I'm going to destroy them. Because of what Aaron has done. That's the eloquent man. It's not eloquence. It is the calling of God and the gift of God, which is without repentance. He knows our value. He knows what we have. He knows what we do not have. Uh, Pastor so-and-so doesn't have this. God knows. Sister so-and-so doesn't have that. God knows. And yet he chooses that pastor or chooses that sister with all that he knows because the ones we are talking about that have the gift of speaking the tongues of men and angels the charity the love to die for the people and to hold on to the world to the very end they don't have that's why it says without charity everything is vain i'm sure you know another man when we talk about prophets his name is balaam that man said I keep my eyes open and I can see the trance. I see him. He's coming. And he's talking about Christ. And he said, he has power. And when he comes, who shall stand? Who shall be alive? When this comes to pass, that same Balaam. 
Look at what Jesus said about him in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 14. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. You see that man? Even though he had the gift, it's not the gift, it's the grace. It's not the charisma, it's the character. It's not the boldness and the courage of a bulldog. It is the conviction of a real child of God that keeps standing there, earnestly defending, contending for the faith once, de once delivered unto the saints. That's what we need today. And I pray God will grant us an abundance of this gift with grace in Jesus' name. We're coming to Ecclesiastes, talking about people that have depths of wisdom and height of knowledge. It tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 16, here is Solomon, I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem, yea, my heart, as great experience of wisdom and knowledge. No doubt about that. Talk about knowledge. Do I have all knowledge? Do I have all understanding? And I can understand all mysteries. Yet, if I do not have charity, I am nothing. Look at Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. You remember? The United Kingdom of Israel broke because of this man of great stature, great wisdom, great knowledge, great understanding. Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, seen by these things, yet among many nations, was there no king like him? Who was beloved of his God? And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him, man of wisdom, man of knowledge, man of understanding, understanding great mysteries, and people came from different nations far and near to come and ask about, to come and ask some hard questions. And there was nothing too mysterious for him. He answered all their questions. Yet nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Women there, not two, not three, not ten, not thirty, not a hundred, not three hundred, not four hundred. You know how many they are. And so, it is not just the knowledge we have or the gifts we have. It's this charity that we're talking about. Luke, sorry, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn and cut down. And cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name I've done, what? Many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, if you look at verses um, 22 and 23, in that verse 22, if there's somebody in the church that has this kind of gift, prophesying in the name of the Lord, and then in the name of the Lord, casting out devils, even if they're legions, and then in the name of the Lord, be many wonderful works and miracles. That person would look like I'm on top of the church, not just on top of the world. And he feels that that gives him liberty to live carelessly and to live um, kind of fraudulently and to do anything. Because if you say, uh, what are we hearing about you? Well, I'm sorry about that. Okay, you step aside. Step out and, you know, go and pray. I go and pray, all right. And then people come. They said, my son is having mental challenge. Please pray. They said, I should go and pray. Who said you should go and pray? And then another one is having, you know, my boy don't have any child. I hear that when you prayed for so-and-so, they've been waiting for 17 years, and now they have their children, and I come, I should pray. They say I should not pray for anybody now. They say I should, uh, you know, step out there and step aside. Who said that? Well, fight that pastor. Uh, they don't know who they should discipline. They don't know who they should say should step aside or step out. No, this will not happen. And then the church will begin to rally around the person and the person will fold his hand and be watching us fighting and fighting because of him and saying, I knew that will happen. Give it to him. He says, his pastor, he knows how to discipline people. Give it to him. And then eventually, if that pastor does not have any backbone, if he's saying, I don't want to die, but you know, this, nobody will not die. One day you will die. I said one day I will die. Uh huh. You said amen for me. You didn't say for yourself. You see, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you die sleeping on the bed or you die fighting the battle of the Lord or you die under stress and under conflict where you are saying, no, this will not be. That we are endlessly content for the faith once delivered unto the saints and you die while you are contending, you'll go straight to heaven. But you know the people that are saying, no, we cannot stop him because he's a miracle worker. We cannot stop him because he's prophesying. We cannot stop him because he's the favorite of the whole people, of the whole church. And if you touch him, the church will collapse, not the church of Jesus Christ. The people that will go are the people that already they were not there before. They were only there physically and they were not dependable. Conflict will scatter them and then they run away. And I'm so I'm sorry. It's my action that threw, that uh, kind of uh, drove them away. No, it's not your action. It is their own nature. They were ready to go before. And those who are going to remain will remain. And will remain in the truth and remain with the truth in Jesus' name. But you know that you hear the point here. We need to help people who think that prophesying and that preaching, that singing, that casting out devils, that making deliverance or doing this or doing that without charity, that that's the whole story. No, it's not the whole story. It will be the most expensive waste of your life if you continue like that and there's nobody to check up on you. Let me show you another man before I go to the next point. We're looking at Judges. We're looking at Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8, and I'm reading here from verse 4. Judges chapter 8, we're looking at verse 4. In Judges chapter 8, looking at verse 4, it says, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing. Faith, you faint yet pursuing so far so good as you see a man with a team of 300 militant people and they were fighting the battle of the lord and even though they were faced they still pursued and eventually they won the victory but please come to verse 24 of that same chapter 
the same chapter. We have not even gone beyond that chapter when the fourth and the one faint and yet pursuing. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that she would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred uh, shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chase that were about their camel's necks. Look at verse 27. Here is Gideon. Here is Gideon, a courageous man. Here is Gideon, a fervent man. Here is Gideon, a man that even though he was faint, he kept on fighting the battle of the Lord. Here is Gideon, the champion and the most, uh, the, the most gifted of them all. Verse 27, and Gideon made an effort thereof and put it in a city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither, a warring after it, which sin became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. You see how the man ended? You see, it is not you know, how fast we run, what power we demonstrate, and what acumen we are able to show. This is the same Gideon who destroyed the idols of his father. When he was called into the ministry, and now he ended up praising an idol for the nation after he had done such great things, serving or ministering with great eloquence, serving or ministering with great gifts of prophecy, of wisdom, of knowledge, serving, ministering with great miracle working power mountain moving face, a great ministry of help and kindness in generous giving with great zeal, sacrificing of life and family without divine love in the heart, the most expensive waste. These things, eloquence, ability to communicate the gospel, gifts of prophecy, all these things, understanding of kingdom mysteries, all these things, the great faith, feeding and financing the poor, zeal in service that you can give your body to be bought, they're good, they're commendable, they're profitable, they're rewardable when they proceed from a heart filled with Christ-like love, otherwise... It's an unfortunate waste. We come to point number three now. The more exceptional workers. The more exceptional workers. As we think about the work the Lord has given us to do. And then we see what attitude he wants us to have. What sacrifice he wants us to make. And what love and charity he wants us to demonstrate. There are people who have done that before us. Number one, Joseph's sacrificial service. That's in Genesis chapter 40, verses 6 to 23. I'll tell you what happened there. You know, Joseph had been cast into the prison. And out of, there was no fault in his hand. He was pure, he was good, he was holy, he was righteous. But that woman told a big lie against him. He was in a foreign land and he couldn't defend himself. And eventually in the prison, he saw those two other prisoners from Pharaoh. He saw that they were sad. In his own condition, he shouldn't even be thinking about other people. But this is the charity we're talking about. That he had sacrificial service. He said, why are you sad? And he told him, oh, he said, interpretation comes from God. He interpreted the dreams for them. He brought succor and comfort unto them. That's the kind of service the Lord wants us to manifest. That we have the more exceptional 
work. Number two is Moses. He was coming from the mountain. And God said, Moses, go down to your people. Moses, come. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy the whole of the nation, but my program will still be on. I will make of you a greater nation than they. You know, look at that offer. He declined that offer. He said, no, I don't want that. Count these people as your people. They have sinned? Yes, I know. And they have gone into idolatry? Yes, I know. And you want to replace them with me. You want me to be the great nation that will come out of me at my age. And you're going to start all over with me. No, Lord, don't do that. Forgive them and count them your people. That's the, work, that's the charity we're talking about. He had unprecedented offer. He turned it down. We're thinking of Nehemiah now. Nehemiah was the one that came to build the walls of Jerusalem. And then troubles came. And he said, they are after you. And ten times over, they told him, they sent to him, they'll come at a time you don't expect. He organized those people that were walking. He said, you'll hold the weapon on one hand and you'll hold the shovel on the other hand. And he himself, he said, I'm at the forefront of the battle. He said, we didn't even remove our clothes except for washing. We well, were all the time awake and were looking at where the enemy will come. He said, the people had a mind to walk. That's the kind of people God is looking for. The people that say, we're going to give our very lives and we do it out of love and then we come to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 we're told of Zechariah was an old man now he was married to Elizabeth but the problem was there was no child but that did not bother Zechariah he had prayed and prayed and prayed and it appeared the prayer was not going to be answered and since it was not answered he carried on the work of God People who will jest, will jet, those who will joke, will joke, those who will make fun, will make fun. Uh huh. He only knows how to serve, he only knows how to worship, he only knows how to sacrifice. But then look at their family. The family is this, the family is that. Didn't bother him at all. But while he was doing that in old age, an angel came and said, Zacharias, your prayer is come for a memorial. Your prayer is answered. And he said, you see, not too late. We have adjusted our minds. We're not even expecting now. But we're going to have the forerunner of the Savior of the world. You see, when we go on serving the Lord, whatever the needs are, whatever the problems may be, we're serving the Lord. The Lord will reward us eventually in Jesus' name. And then we come to Peter's single-minded devotion. You remember after Jesus rose from the dead. And Peter said, I go a fishing. And the other said, if you go a fishing, what else are we going to do? We'll follow you too. And then Jesus came to them, children, do you have any meat? They had no meat. And they said, throw your net there. And they caught quite a lot. And now Jesus came and said, Simon Peter, honestly, sincerely, from the depth of your heart, lovest thou me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know, I love you. Apart from what happened, you know my heart, I love you. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Lord, I love you. The third time he asked him again, says Simon, let's settle this thing. Because there's a lot ahead. The day of Pentecost is very near. Preaching to those multitudes very near. And then chapter 4, you don't understand, they are going to put you in prison. I'm asking you, do you love me more than whatever will happen? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep and feed my lamb. Then he said, follow me. And I was only talking to him. And here is John. And here is that other person. Here is that other person. And then Peter said, Lord, if this is for me, look at this man, your man. The one you love and the one who loves you. What will he do? And Jesus said, What is that to thee? Leave that between him and myself. You follow me. 
That's a single-minded devotion the Lord is asking for. There's no room for comparison. That, you know, this one is like that and this one is doing that, that one is doing that, I about me. He said, there's no room for comparison. Bring all your heart, all your soul and all your mind and consecrate and devote everything to me. And then eventually, the Lord wanted to send people to the missionary field. And here was Antioch Church. And the best of the people there, Barnabas and Saul. And it is not about Saul, and it's not about Barnabas, it's now about the church. Would they be willing to release the best of their people when the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have for them? Or will the church be holding on to them? Those are men. Those are the best people that we have. If you don't want to paralyze the church here, you don't want to destroy the church here, you can choose. Look at this other one. That one can go to the foreign field. That one can go. But you're thinking of Saul. You're thinking of Barnabas. Who is left? Once those two, once those two are gone, but they didn't argue. They released. That's the kind of love and that's the kind of charity we see in the New Testament. And Paul himself is unwavering obedience. Let's come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I'm reading here from verse 15. Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I have sent thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me whereupon O King Agrippa I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Much water went under the bridge. And much a roaring of the lion. And as much a wave of waves of the sea. Much trouble, much persecution. To the point of stoning him, stoning him dead. And letting him for dead. He rose up again and kept on ministering. And then he gives us a catalog of everything that he suffered. And yet he said, you know what, Agrippa? That means nothing to me. Because of the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That will be you now. Amen. God will give you the grace. Amen. God will give you the strength. Amen. And the Lord will help you to go on to the very end in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse start 1. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse start 1. In verse start 1, it says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. I pray that every one of us with strength, with grace, with ability, will follow this excellent way in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me hear a good, good amen. amen. We're going to pray and we're going to pray our heart out. We're going to tell the Lord that this more excellent way he has revealed unto us. We're going to follow it through. We're not going to allow anything to make us waste our lives, waste our talents, and waste everything that we have got. We're going to really pray. I'm expecting you to stand up and then to pray and to give your heart afresh and life afresh, everything you've got afresh, unto the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I'm available. I'm going to serve you with all my heart and with all my soul and everything I've got 
and I'm going to do it in love. I'm going to do it with charity. I'm going to do it with divine love. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.